Good evening, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, and of course, especially Professor Norman Davies. Uh, of course, I don't need to say, but I will, that it's been a real honor to uh, host Professor Davies uh, tonight. And I have to admit that it was not an easy job to persuade him to come, not that he would not want to. Uh, after all, he has been a member of the House of European History Academic Committee and helping enormously in develop, developing the project from the start, but because he has been, if I may use the term, sold out. Not only that his last book, published at the end of last year, Beneath Another Sky, has proved to be a success, not that I think anybody uh, doubted it, but his lectures are on high demand, therefore the competition, who would get the privilege to get him to accept an invitation was really uh, hard. Professor Davies has arrived and a title of his lecture, The Impossible Task of Presenting the Past, History and Museums Tonight, also mark the beginning of the conference of the House of European History, which aim is to evaluate the project of building up this special museum and to discuss what the future development of it should look like. I really don't need to mention, and I'm not going to, all the books written in decades of Professor Davis's scientific work. There are many, there are classics, translated in several languages, and many of them real bestsellers. With his knowledge of languages, interest from early age in Central and Eastern European history, well, I didn't read Wikipedia, but some interviews, <laughs> <laughs> as well as political reality of the Cold War, Professor Davies started his researches in Poland, and after that, it has not been a corner of Europe, he, in Europe he would not research and wrote about. And with his last book, uh, as he said, he finally made uh, a global journey, journey into, into history. So I cannot avoid to mention his bestseller, Europe, a History, uh, which own development has a very exciting story. And this book was among some fundamental works which inspired and helped our team in putting up a narrative for the House of European History. Not only because wide and deep knowledge and expertise which have been reflecting through the words written in it, but also because it has been a proof how a highly scientific work can capture a style which brings history close to readers who are not professional historians. And in these, the House had the same ambition, which I think we have uh, fulfilled in big part as well. Well, I brought something with me to uh, stress my words. Well, and I, I got it on loan only of the promise that this will be signed. So this is... Europe a history. You can see a very, very used example. Well, this book belongs to a very good friend of mine, Jan Peter Koch from Amsterdam, who is a composer and who is also the theater music teacher. And since I was so exciting in early 2011 that Professor Davis was also in our committee and that I had met him, well, he got this book, and of, although it is nearly two kilos heavy, this book has been with him in every travel, in every journey across Europe since then. Well, you can see uh, that uh, in a kind of intensity of my uh, words. And what is so interesting is that this book is inspiration for him. He takes it as an inspiration when he teaches. He takes it on every corner in Europe when he, where he travels because he always finds something which is connected with the cities, with regions, and with uh, uh, present. And of course, I agree uh, with you, Professor Davies, that these capsules 
uh, should uh, you should put a copyright on them because <laughs> that <laughs> that is really something which attracts uh, uh, attention, and maybe this is uh, as you once said in an interview that. In spite of getting invitations to lecture on uh, your book, uh, Europe History, you had never got an invitation to talk about in, in Ox Oxford. And you added at that time, probably because it's a popular book beneath their dignity. But I think that writing a book so that you can capture thousands and thousands of people who are not professional historians is actually what a genius historian, a researcher and scientist uh, only can do. So, and there is, uh, I would say, uh, and the last part of my introduction, which is rather personal one. And when we started working on a narrative for the permanent exhibition of this museum, for me, leading the project, it felt like starting to climb the highest, toughest, and unhospitable mountain. Exactly a moment when one needs a helping hand, an encouraging word, an expression of trust. At least this is how I felt the first months after taking this responsibility. And Professor Davis actually gave me the hand not only one encouraging word, but many, and also feeling of trust, which I needed, that in a way I could do it. So for me, because of all what I said, Professor Davis remains a giant among historians and a man with heart and compassion. So, and now the word is yours, Professor Davis. Well, thank you very much, Taya, for those uh, very kind words. <laughs> um, the book is like me. It will fall over at some point fairly soon. Um, so I'm going to sit down. Um, the basic vocabulary of time, past, present, and future, is very straightforward. But the English word history not only means uh, the English word history is ambiguous. It not only means the events of the past, but also the study of the past and narratives of the past based on its study. Each of these things is radically different, and my argument today is very dependent on those differences. Fortunately, some languages are less ambiguous. Polish, which happens to be my domestic language, has three separate words for three concepts. Przeszłość means past time, dzieje means events of the past, and historia means the study of the past. I am a historic because I try to study history. By convention, the, co the concept of history has two further connotations. One is, as an academic subject, that it refers to the history of mankind, as opposed to the history of the universe, cosmology, or to life on Earth in general. The other is that it's usually limited to recorded history, as distinct from prehistory, that is, from the period of history, period of the past, without documentation. The main characteristic of history in the sense of the sum total of past events, lies in its near infinity. It is almost too vast to comprehend, and certainly too enormous to be fully reconstructed in detail. According to those who know, 108 billion human beings have lived on Earth since Homo sapiens evolved. Each of them consists of 30 trillion cells and carries 40 trillion bacteria. Only 9.7 billion human creatures are alive today, but the greater numbers evolved over time remind one of counting the stars of the sky or the grains of sand in the desert. It simply can't be done accurately. 
And it isn't just a matter of numbers. Every human being possesses his or her unique personality and is the potential subject of a biography. Every single one has belonged to a nuclear or extended family, to a tribe of hunter-gatherers, to a migrant group or a party of settlers, to a village, town, city, state or nation, to a civilization, to a gender, a linguistic fraternity, a class, craft, profession, age group, blood group, political group, to a religion, school, firm or sports league, to the hale and hearty or to the sick or dying, and so on and so on. Everyone, whether individually or collectively, can be analysed from political, economic, social, cultural, psychological, medical, nutritional, geographical, environmental, demographical, statistical and angles, to mention just a few. The entire task of embracing the whole of humanity in all its aspects and in all periods is simply impossible. Historians and others who strive to deal with this overwhelming past are constantly obliged to think in terms of generalizations and approximations. Their work in its essence is selective. In other words, the past is too big for comfort, too big for efficient summary. It's also important to note that 99% of humankind in the past, the great mass, was illiterate. Books and books, book learning are relatively recent inventions. Record-based history is even more so. Great swathes of the world population remain uneducated. And illiterates are probably surfing the internet today for audiovisual information blithely ignoring the written word. If one of the Stone Age persons, which still exist in parts of the world, were brought here to Brussels, he or she would not benefit one bit from this book, but would manage to glean something from the House of European History. For history and museums approach the past with their own techniques and methods, and they appeal to different audiences. Before returning to historiography and museology, therefore, I'd like very briefly to review the multifarious channels whereby people endeavour to access the elusive past. And I shall have to cut this short. Every healthy human being possesses a memory, enabling them to recall their recent actions and in the longer term, their personal origins. Notoriously fallible, selective and unreliable, memory filters the flow of sensations entering the brain, and its remit is necessarily limited to three or four generations. Collective memory operates when individual memories are pulled. Genealogy, once the preoccupation of rulers and aristocrats seeking to legitimize their authority, is now a popular pastime boosted by the internet. Already preserved king lists, as in Ireland, long preceded written family trees. Ancestor worship holds pride of place in many traditional cultures. In the case of the Maoris of New Zealand, who had sailed to the land of the long white cloud, as they call it, at a time when they couldn't properly calculate, in fact, some 800 years ago, it promoted an unusual mental posture. Gazing back at their ancestors, the Maoris talked of the past as the place in front, whereas the future was the place behind. This means that mentally, they were walking backwards into the future. Some traditional societies, including uh, Native Americans, counted the pa passage of time more accurately by means of notched sticks. The notches signified either moon cycles or annual winters. 
Myths and legends were of vital importance in the ages before writing. Every people had their creation myth. The ancient Greeks, for example, as alliterated in this museum, celebrated the legend of Europa, the Phoenician princess seduced by Zeus in the guise of a white bull, who rode on his back to the island of Crete. Yet the production of myths continues unabated in this literate age. They proliferate more rapidly than the findings of academic history. All the major religions are de deeply concerned with the past and its interpretation. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the book of Genesis is fundamental. In the beginning, God made the earth and all that is found therein. In my own Europe history, I dared to parody that sentence. In the beginning, I began, there was no Europe. All there was was one long sinuous peninsula set at the end of the world's largest landmass. Now, poetry, visual art, art, art history, film and uh, video, photography, fictional lit literature, uh, sound recording, music, monuments and memorials, documents, libraries, all have paragraphs which I must skip. Archaeology is history's best known auxiliary science. It recovers the material remains of human life, including bones, burials, and rubbish tips, analyzes them, and draws conclusions about the culture that produced them. It is especially active with respect to prehistoric and medieval finds, but not only. One of the digs which recently caught my eye was a Polish expedition to the Middle Nile, to Faras in Sudan, where an entire 6th century Christian village was recovered from the rising waters of the Aswan Dam. Other sciences auxiliary to history include paleography, numismatics, philately, calligraphy, demography, choreography, cleometrics, diplomatics, epigraphy, her 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 heraldry, onomastics, sigillography, toponymy, and many others. All these various routes into the past have one thing in common. They are all partial and selective. Each of them illuminates one area of the past while sidelining others. All their results are limited, fragmentary, and incomplete. History, too, has its severe limitations. Despite subsuming all other subjects and disciplines within it, historians have written histories of memory, histories of art history, histories of literature, histories of archaeology, histories of technology, and of course, histories of history writing, which we called historiography. History aspires, in fact, to cover everything that ever happened to humankind up to a split second ago. Needless to say, this aspiration is unattainable. For one, human actions, which took place in three dimensions, have to be reduced into a flow of words on a two-dimensional page. For another, the past unfolds in motion. History books are static, unless they fall over. <laughs> in the European tradition, History is traced back to the ancient Greek Herodotus from the 5th century, <clears throat> and in China to his near contemporary Zhou Kaiming. In modern times, however, its development fell very largely into European hands. It was revived during the Renaissance by Machiavelli, whose history of Florence was a milestone, Expanding older methods of the analyst and chroniclers, it acquired its basic procedures from general philosophers, 
creating chronological narratives based on reasoned argument. Significantly, Britain's first modern historian, David Hume, star of the Scottish Enlightenment, was a professional philosopher. Important contributions were also made by the French encyclopedists and by the pioneers of the German Göttingen School of History. Yet the central figure in the 19th century was undoubtedly the Saxon scholar Leopold von Ranke, whose principles demanded the coordination of teaching and research, the critical study of primary sources, the production of a reasoned narrative, and the historian's objective posture. Ranke battled both philosophers like Hegel, wedded to abstract historical models, and the legion of fact compilers. History, he said, tells it as it really was, wie es eigentlich gewesen. And his methods greatly facilitated the growth during his lifetime of academic history departments around Europe. Oxford's Faculty of History, for example, opened its doors in 1880, at a guess. <laughs> Over recent decades, history has become more inclusive than previously. Early last century, it was still overwhelmingly political in content, concentrating on the domestic and international affairs of states and powers. Under the influence of Karl Marx and others, economic history gained ground. Political economy, produced by the interplay of politics and economics, emerged as a key field. In due course, the social sciences were applied to the past, thereby encouraging various forms of social and cultural history. <clears throat> More recently, historians have moved into gender studies, women's history, environmental history, and as mentioned earlier, global history. The net effect was simultaneously to broaden the subject's overall scope while fragmenting it into ever more specialisms. Each such field attracts its own specialists, develops its own ethos and jargon, and builds its own infrastructure of associations, journals, and academic posts. Today, the besetting sin of the historical profession is ultra-specialization, which always obscures the broader picture. <clears throat> the cry goes up. That is not my field. European history is generally judged to have been launched in 1828 by the politician and writer François Guizot with his Histoire générale de la civilisation en Europe. The growing genre thereon acquired some bad habits. One was to concentrate on a handful of so-called great powers. Another was to follow those powers' wars and diplomacy, avoiding the wider overview. And a third was to highlight Western Europe at the expense of the numerous nations and cultures of Eastern Europe. As in politics, European history was mentally divided into a superior West the source of Western civilization, and the uh, supposedly inferior East, which, with the exception of Russia, could be safely ignored. <clears throat> In the English-speaking world, these prejudices and assumptions, reinforced by the Cold War, stayed in place unruffled until the 1980s. In the USA, obligatory courses on Western civilization were imposed on all students. In Great Britain and British-led countries, the book dominating the bookshelves for 50 years and more was H.L. Fisher's History of Europe, first published in 1935. Educated at Winchester College in Oxford and Minister of Education under Lord George, <clears throat> Fisher echoed the prevailing views of British Britain's political and academic establishment. Yet despite the luxury of three large volumes, three volumes like that, 
Despite that luxury, Fisher failed to notice anything east of the River Elbe. His mental map mirrored that of his close contemporary, Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister, 1937-40, who notoriously characterized Czechoslovakia during the Munich crisis as a faraway country about which we know nothing. <laughs> this is the point where I came onto the scene, and I apologize. I apologize for some personal memories about the Oxford history of Europe. It was the late Gorbachev era, the Cold War was ending, and the editors of Oxford University Press, Britain's leading academic publisher, had decided to produce a comprehensive volume on European history that encomp encompassed both East and West. At the time, I was OUP's author of their history of Poland and was not initially con considered for the pan-European venture. What ensued, however, was revealing. None of the distinguished Oxford dons with pulse in European history knew much about Eastern Europe at all or felt confident enough to write about it. Three of them were approached in turn, but none, none passed the test. And the day came when AUP's desperate chief history editor called me in and asked, do you know anything about Western Europe? And so, in 1988, I was given the commission that consumed nine years of my life. In the introduction to Europe history, I discussed three main variants of what European history can mean. Firstly, it can be the history of a geographical subcontinent whose precise boundaries have varied, but which now stretches from the Atlantic to the Urals and from Norway's North Cape to the Mediterranean. Secondly, it can be seen as a civilization whose roots lay in Greece, Rome, and Christendom before spreading its tentacles to many parts of the globe, including the Americas and Australasia. Thirdly, it can be understood as the history of a contemporary political movement, aiming to unify Europe and culminating with the European Union. For practical reasons, I chose not to pursue Europe overseas and now question that choice. In the pre-publication publicity campaign, Europe a History was announced as a total history of Europe addressing all aspects of all the continent's regions in all eras. <laughs> Very modest. <laughs> From the outset, I knew this description to be an exaggeration, but nonetheless set out to create an impression of totality. The structure of the book was crucial. I wrote <clears throat> different sections of the book in different degrees of magnification likening the process to that of a photographer, ringing the changes by employing a wide-angle fisheye lens for some pictures and a standard lens or a telephoto lens for others. Twelve main narrative chapters code the period from the last ice age to 1991 in wide-angle style. The first chapter, named Environment and Prehistory, covered 35,000 years in 41 periods, 40, 41 pages, or 853 years per page. Each of the following chapters covered ever-shortening periods of time until chapter 12, Europe divided and undivided, 1945 to 91, embraced 46 years in 72 pages, an average of seven months per page. The east-west balance was maintained throughout. On 8th of December 1991, the leaders of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine signed a declaration stating that the USSR has ceased to exist. On the very next morning at Maastricht, a group of West European leaders put their initials to the treaty 
which created the European Union. And that's where it stops. Next, a so-called snapshot was placed after each chapter, describing one event in greater detail as per a standard lens. After chapter one came a six-page description <coughs> of the volcanic eruption at Santorini in 1628 BC. After chapter 11, near the end, came eight pages on the flawed Nuremberg trials of 1946. As a third layer of magnification, as if by telephoto lens, I added a sprinkling of 300 short capsules to spice up the chapters further. Each capsule was roughly one page in length and was directed to one esoteric topic, from prehistoric food recipes to the history of jazz. In order to identify the capsule's contents, I had to draw up an enormous graph with 60 general topics down the side and five historical periods across the top. The list of topics, including everything from philosophy and science to music, manners and mayhem, the historical periods from the prehistoric to classical, medieval, early modern and modern. With the help of the computerized catalog of Harvard's Vina Library, a technological marvel not yet available then in Oxford, I was able to add a third dimension to the boxes on the graph, introducing the fivefold division of Europe's regions. After that, I could permutate all the topics against, against both time and place, and the computer would supply the relevant titles and books and art articles. For example, I remember getting stuck with a combination of women's history and medieval, having done all the obvious things like uh, St. Teresa or um, Hildegard and so on. And then I added Northern Europe, and the computer spewed up a title on breastfeeding in 15th century Iceland, just what the doctor ordered. Once I had ma mastered the technique, I soon had my 300 capsules and could scatter them around the chapters. Their effect could only be described as impressionistic, even a pointillistic illusion of totality. Fortunately, Europe a History, published in 1996, was not a flop. Despite weighing in at 1,365 pages, it topped the non-fiction bestseller lists and was translated into nearly 30 languages. One reviewer paid it the ultimate compliment. This book <coughs> provides the music as well as the libretto. European history can never be written in the old way again. I then became interested in museums. Museums are almost as old as history, at least in name. The Greek word museon, meaning seat of the muses, was a name given to a section of the royal palace in Alexandria, reserved for academic activities, but not for an element of exhibition or display. In ancient Greek mythology, the nine muses were the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne, the divine embodiment of memory. I got it wrong, didn't I? The nine included Cleo, the muses of history, Tipsicora, the music of, muse of dance, and other assorted patroness, patronesses of poetry and drama, but not of the plastic arts. The collection of objects, however, has been practiced since time immemorial. Classical temples contain treasuries, as did their counterparts in the Middle East or China, while wealthy Greeks and Romans adorned their houses with murals, statues, portraits, and mosaics. 
Centuries later, the Renaissance inspired a veritable fever for the collection of classical antiquities. Every self-respecting ruler and aristocrat kept his cabinet de curiosité, or Kunstkammer, displaying art, inscriptions, coins, medals, weapons, and jewels. Schloss Ambras, near Innsbruck, the re residence from 1563 of the Tyrolean Archduke Ferdinand II, claims to be the oldest museum in the world. Most of those early collections consisted of little more than a jumble of paintings and aimless piles of bric-a-bac. The establishment of orderly displays of objects in dedicated buildings was the work of the Enlightenment. Oxford's Ashmolean Museum, opened in 1683, is often given the laurels. The year 1753 saw the opening of the British Museum. In France, in the 1770s, Louis XVI began the long task of converting the Louvre Palace. The French Revolution, <clears throat> which expropriated all royal and aristocratic collections, strengthened feelings of a national patrimony. But it also reinforced the systematic looting of conquered territories. Here in Brussels, which was besieged by the revolutionary forces of the French Re Republic in the month of Messidor of the year two, that is July 1794, Republican officials justified their shameless pillage, celebrating their victory over the tyrants and declaring that works of genius should be, should be deposited sous les mains des hommes libres. Convoys of plunder were soon rolling towards Paris. In 1795, it was the turn of Warsaw. The Russian army emptied the galleries and libraries of the Polish capital for the enrichment of St. Petersburg. In 1796, General Bonaparte headed for Italy, which was to be so thoroughly sacked that Rome could be no longer found in Rome. In 1801, he repeated the exercise in Egypt. Lord Elgin, who carried off the Parthenon marbles from Athens, had many competitors. Throughout the 19th century, museums proliferated, as did their diversity. Like Heinz baked beans, they came in 57 varieties. Art museums, natural history museums, science museums, municipal museums, archaeological museums, ethnographic museums, military museums, literary museums, sports museums, wax museums, and innumerable, innumerable smaller museums dedicated to individual personalities. And the trend continued. Now, nowadays, an estimated 55,000 museums operate across the world, helping to illuminate every subject under the sun. No less than three museums are dedicated to the history of smell. The particular genre of historical museums, which put art aside and aimed to expand the history of nations, regions or cities, alter knowledge of specific events, has also mul multiplied but I cannot adjudicate between the competitive, competing claims of precedence. As usual, the Russians have staked a strong claim. According to the great Soviet encyclopedia, a Peter the Great Museum was established in the village of Vesky, Pyrilaslav Oblast, in 1803, where a small boat belonging to the great Tsar was preserved and dubbed the grandfather of the Russian Navy. That's like that claim to have invented ballistic missiles and jazz. I also note a historical museum apparently founded in Ljubljana in 1821. The French Musée National Historique was created 
in Versailles in 1835. For many years, all historical museums put the emphasis on display, displays of authentic objects and documents preserved from the relevant place and period, and nourishing what the French call la leçon des choses, the lesson of material things. They also counted on the aura of wonder which such displays can evoke by connecting the visitor very directly with the past. Jules Michelet, one of France's greatest historians, confessed that his own sense of history had been aroused by a boyhood visit to the Louvre's Musée des Monuments Francais. More recently, the museum experience has been enhanced by new technologies, as the new Pan Tadeusz Museum in Wrocław in Poland Visual displays can be accompanied by period music, by voices from the past, and even by screen debates between academics. Both history books <clears throat> and museological exhibitions appeal to the imagination, but the ways they do it differ enormously. Digital techniques are especially effective in re relieving the spatial problem which all museums face. In practice, no museum can ever provide enough space for all the items which ideally they would wish to display. And most of them keep more stuff in their basement than on the exhibition floor. After the Second World War, the French novelist <coughs> and art historian and Minister of Culture, André Malraux, addressed the problem by floating his idea of the Musée Imaginaire, the museum without walls. Malraux had spent many years in Indochina and the Middle East and was eager to promote the comparative study of European art with art from Asia and Africa. Yet he realized that the capacity of France's existing museums and galleries would be pressed to expand sufficiently. So his answer was to encourage people to use photographs and to widen their mental horizon beyond the museum's physical parameters. 30 years after Malraux's death, the arrival of computers with almost unlimited digital space turned his dreams to reality. In the USA, the Getty Foundation's online schol scholarly catalog is making a very valuable contribution. In Britain, the Public Catalog Foundation has achieved amazing results by recording all the oil paintings in the kingdom. The decision in 2006 to launch the House of European History, therefore, was taken at the end of a very long line of antecedents. In the first instance, the decision was taken by Dr. Hans Gert Pöttering, President of the European Parliament, and the EP has remained the project sponsor ever since. In his inauguration address of the 2nd of February 2007, Dr. Pöttering summarised his view of the project's mission. The House of European History is intended to convey the outlines of European history so as to foster understanding of more recent events and of the present. The exhibition will show the common values of European unification, human dignity, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, peace, and the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity, as rep representing the progress of peaceful coexistence since the Second World War. Furthermore, the House aims to promote greater involvement from citizens in political decision-making in Europe. I take the key phrases to be outlines of history, European integration, common values, overcoming division, and the greater involvement of citizens. In the initial phase, uh, major obstacles arose and after surviving the threat of total failure, the House was, 
in the words of the Parliament Secretary General, an act of resurrection. It had been competing with two early EU-backed projects. One, the original Museum of European History, sponsored by Madame Antoinette Spark. The other, the historical section of the so-called Parliamentarium. As it happened, I took part in each of these rival projects and witnessed the resultant tensions. The Secretary Gen General also mentioned the hostility of a europhobe British press, which was fair comment. Once the EP's formal approval was obtained, the next step was to form a committee of experts to draw up a conceptual basis. The committee's experienced chairman, Professor Hans Walter Hüter, had served as chair of the German House of History at Bonn and was joined by eight colleagues, a Pole, an Italian, a Belgian, a Finn, a Dutchman, a Portuguese, and two ladies from France and Hungary, respectively, but no Welshman. Together, they laid down important guidelines to concentrate on the period since 1914, to protect the project's academic independence, and to call on the House to acquire its own collection. Their conceptual document was adopted by the EP Bureau on the 15th of December 2008. When I invent, uh, entered the fray with some delay, I voiced my criticism of that conceptual document. To my mind, while stressing strong opposition to nationalism and national histories, its 116 clauses formed a rag bag of ideas which could not possibly add up to a single coherent concept. Oddly enough, these shortcomings did not seem to matter. All the problems of content and objectives were resolved in due course by the practical wisdom of the museum team. In 2009, two important bodies were set up. One was the Board of Trustees, headed by Dr. Pettering, in fact, the governing body. Uh, the other was the Board of Academic Ex Advisors, chaired by Professor Vojimish Boroje, to which I was also appointed. My recollection, recollections of that stage are, let's say, rather mixed. The project team, which was to bring the house to fruition, did not yet exist. Much of the talk was about finance and architectural competitions. The Eurocrats seemed to be in complete control. Several advisers left, and progress was very slow. The proposed opening date of 2014 was simply unrealistic. On the positive side, it was exhilarating to see the birth bang, pangs of something entirely new and fascinating to sit in the middle of a multilingual, multinational model. In 2010, the architectural and construction elements of the project began to bear fruit, but the real step change occurred in 2011 when the museum team was brought together and Dr. Taya Fuk van Gaal was appointed director. In my estimation, this was the key moment. Henceforth, all the essentials began to move. The content of the exhibitions, the design of the building, the accumulation of objects, and the preparation of all the paperwork. As is proper, the advisor, advisory committee's role remained peripheral, though its sporadic meetings became more lively and purposeful. My own feeling was that the team could cope perfectly well without us. My main concern, as with Europe a history, was that a reasonable balance should be maintained between East and West, and with one exception, my fears were allayed. The disappointing moment was produced by the, reje the rejection of a proposal to make 1989 the major turning point in the final phase of the permanent exhibition.
Throughout those same years, I served on the advisory board of another nascent museum, the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk in Poland. Professor Borodzie also sat, uh, served on the boards of both places, so we had a perfect gauge for comparison. The Gdańsk Museum started down the runway in 2007, as did the House of European History. It's originated, the counterpart of Dr. Pöttering was Donald Tusk, now President of the European Council. Its sensational building, designed by Polish architects, owes nothing in, splendid, in splendor to this building. Its first-class director, Dr. Pavel Maksevich, possessed the same skill and metal as Dr. Van Gaal, and his team was every bit as competent as the team in Brussels. Indeed, until they met serious flooding on the site, they were galloping even faster than their colleagues in the House of European History. They too were shunning narrow national perspectives, and their exhibition, which opened its doors in early 2017, presented a broad panorama of Europe at war, both military and civilian. Then the blow fell. Poland's populist government, elected in 2015, was not pleased by the museum's success. Hand-picked journalists shouted for the need for repolonization and for taking back control. Party hacks opined that Polish history was not to be dictated by unnamed Britons and Americans meaning myself and Timothy Snyder. Dr. Maksevich was unceremoniously dismissed and subject to legal harassment, which is ongoing. Under instructions from the Minister of Culture, a new director moved in to start the policy of demontage. In Gdańsk, the academic independence which the House of European History has preserved was lost. Nine years' brilliant work were under demolition. I and my wife said our farewells after visiting the museum incognito. The permanent exhibition of the House of History, <clears throat> reaching its debut at a similar time, fitted into the five top floors of the large Eastman building. It had evolved considerably since the early days, was now made up of five sections. Technically savvy visitors proceed with the aid of a multilingual interactive digital tab tablet. Dinosaurs like myself are content with the, the guidebook. Section one, Shaping Europe, is introduced by a splendid quotation from the Dutch novelist Cees Notterboom. His story, sorry, Europe is above all a mental space. I would translate it as a spiritual space. Maps proliferate, the myth of Europe is portrayed by a 6th century uh, bas-relief from Salimunta in Sicily. A small subject, small subsection follows on memory and the European heritage. <clears throat> Next floor up, section two presents Europe a global power, Europe ascendant, 1789 to 1914, and part of section three. Here, the visitor has been brutally catapulted from the classical world to the French Revolution, missing out on the birth of Christendom, medieval Europe, the Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment. The outline has been short-circuited without explanation. Subsections treat political change, markets and people, notions of progress and superiority. A massive British steam hammer from Manchester stands beside Marx's Communist Manifesto. 
Engels lived in Manchester as well. Section 3 <coughs> presents Europe in ruins, 1914 to 45. Europe eclipsed. The exhibition reasonably opts for the theory of a second 30 years war. A brilliant, brilliantly arranged room has Princip's tiny revolver from Sarajevo pointing at a massive moving screen illustrating the consequences of that fateful shot. Global war and mass war precede totalitarianism versus, versus democracy, World War II and the harvest of destruction. Photos, videos, maps, diagrams and posters dominate visually. The editors strive hard to balance Nazism with Stalinism. Even so, before correction, the guidebook contains an awful gaffe. Nazism and Stalinism, the text once read, were the two most brutal forms of communist and socialist regimes. Ouch. <laughs> Section four, rebuilding a divided continent, covers 1945 to the 1970s. Post-war reconstruction, the Cold War, and a large dose of poignant social comment accompany substantial areas given over to the, great, the growth of the European movement. A special place is found for the memory of the Shoah. Ascending to the penultimate floor, the visitor enters the disconcerting section on shattering certain certainties 1970s to today, wondering if the Cold War has finished or not. Further milestones of European integration are interwoven with Western democratization, democratization sudden dictatorships, communism under pressure, and dealing with diversity, finishing with shared and divided memories. In the guidebook, the re reunification of Germany and the disintegration of Yugoslavia received separate subjections, but not the collapse of the USSR. Arriving on the sunlit uplands of the top floor, the visitor faces section seven, accolades and criticism. The upward flow of the exhibition um, encourages the sense of progress and of over overcoming problems. But the final note rightly invites quiet reflection. Since its launch, the House of European History has welcomed almost 200,000 visitors. Generally speaking, the press reviews were indulgent and the organisers could express satisfaction. Nonetheless, not everyone would have been aware of the troll-like accusations fired off by a group connected with the ruling party in Poland. Not only did the trolls accuse the organisers of unacceptable omissions, mainly relating to Polish history and the Catholic Church, they did not refrain from threats. My own feelings about the assault were threefold. Firstly, the accuser's methods were completely beyond the pale. Secondly, the complaints about omissions were not entirely without mer merit. And thirdly, I wondered if the museum's treatment of national history might not have been handled with a bit more cunning. It is all very well for Europhiles to dismiss national sentiments and to write their narratives without them. If they do, they forget that even in the 21st century, the majority of Europeans are still educated in the national traditions of their countries. Self-centered national history predominates in Britain, let alone in Poland or Hungary. Presuming that the aim is to wean potential visitors from their prejudices, it might be more effective to invite them openly to compare the nationalistic approach to history with our preferred pan-European approach. To this end, 
it may be beneficial to offer a, offer a corner of the House of, of European history to each of the Union's member states and invite them to stuff it with their mementos of their glorious heroes, victims and saints. For all to see. Who knows? Owing to ill health, I unfortunately missed two years of the museum's most frenetic phase of final assembly. So perhaps I'm not the best person to pass judgment. Ultimately, the task is always impossible, but the attempt has to be made. In absolute terms, historians and museum makers alike are always condemned to fail, but they can fail defiantly, going down in a blaze of sensational images stunning objects, riveting captions, uplifting thoughts, and mind-changing ideas. Thank you very much. Nobody will go around this museum again with the same eyes. <laughs> so thank you very much, because this is also one of the aims of the conference. We start tomorrow morning to be very critical, self-critical, and to see what could be improved. So before we uh, give the audience uh, free questions, possibility, I would like to thank you very much. This is actually, because everything is about history, this is a collection, the history collection, and I hope that it is not a history only on a page, but it's also taste. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> the big question is, am I allowed to eat it? Well... Perhaps we give one chocolate to everybody. <laughs> in the room. Well, that would be... Uh, According to your wishes. That's very kind. Can you imagine it's stood up? It's, yes, it's perfect. It, but, uh, it's in five pieces. But I cannot get uh, back home to Amsterdam without you signing it. So Can that's. You uh, <laughs> while it's still standing up. Uh, no, I mean, uh, go on that side. <laughs> back of the book and back of the author. <laughs> so now, as we. <laughs> okay, so vanity. Yes. So before uh, we go all to the foyer to have a nice cocktail and to continue. Uh, impressions of this lecture. Uh, as I said, well, three questions uh, to be uh, put to Professor Davis. And we are not uh, making things with microphones because usually they don't work uh, any uh, way and we don't need an interpretation. So I think if you speak up, it is. Okay, you are the first. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarato. And I have a question about more recent developments in Poland and Hungary. And could you enlighten us maybe a little bit about how you see the situation, how it has developed um, politically and democratically in these uh, two countries, uh, because of your great knowledge of this region. For many Westerners, like myself, it seems quite uh, difficult to understand what has been happening in uh, Poland and Hungary. We have been very confused, um, my wife and I. Our son is the Guardian correspondent in Warsaw, so we hear every day what's going on. 
And it's very difficult to uh, grasp why this has all happened. I can remember two or three years of confusion. Why on earth should Poland, which has done better than any European country in the last 25 years, it never had a, uh, an economic crisis in 2008, its GDP is five times bigger than it, it, it was, it receives enormous subsidies from Europe, it has outer bounds and museums and you name it. Um, the average life of the average Polish citizen is miles better than it was, objectively. But subjectively, lots of people, millions of people, don't feel that things are getting better. And this is the puzzle. Why on earth do they feel? It's very similar, I have to say, to Brexit in, in Britain. It's totally irrational. And yet millions of people have convinced themselves, I think through uh, deluded visions of history, that uh, they some, somehow put the clock back and take control. Do you hear that phrase, take control? Um, uh, it's delusionary, but it's, it is very much con uh, connected with history. In Britain, it's connected with um, delusions of the lost imperial past. You know, we were top dog, we will be top dog again. America is the same. Trump is trying to go back to when the United States had no competitors. It was the you know, strongest power in the world and so on. It probably still is the strongest power in the world, but it's going down and others are, are coming up. Um, in Poland, it's more difficult, but um, there is a sort of nostalgia for the certainties of the communist period. Um, there were very bad certainties. <laughs> uh, there were lots of horrible things happened, especially in the uh, Stalinist period. Uh, but nonetheless, there are lots of people somehow feel comfortable with an authoritarian regime um, with um, socialistic um, planning and policies. They feel uncertain about the uh, uh, globalization and the perceived th threat of um, all sorts of things, secular Europe, you know, Western um, dominance, Western um, complacency, superiority complexes, and so on. Um, uh, but can't give you a rational explanation. I, I, it, it, it's uh, the same is true in Hungary. I'll just mention one thing. My, um, uh, in 1959, <laughs> I made a journey by jeep from Manchester to Istanbul, uh, driving an American jeep with U.S. Army written on the side. It's not a good idea, <laughs> uh, and it, it got us arrested, of course. But. Um, uh, we went back 50 years later, in nine, 2009, and we found in Hungary, in Budapest, a sizable demonstration against the Treaty of Trianon of 1920, the time when Hungary lost more territories than Germany or anybody else. Uh, and there was this clear this feeling, we talked to these Hungarians, why on earth are you protesting after whatever it was, you know, 90 years, um, against the Treaty of Trianon? The, the answer was, we, Hungary suffered an injustice, and we're waiting for that injustice to be put right. Um, and that, if you like, is the background to the, what's going on now. Hungarians feeling hurt by what happened generations ago. And it was never put right. And there's something, uh, Poles also have this um, understandable complex of injustice, of terrible things that were uh, done to them for no reason at all, by both their neighbors. Um, uh, and I think that history and perception of history is uh, one of the major factors in what's going on. Sorry, I could go on. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. 
first of all my congratulations for this splendid conference. I would like to mention just one point. You spoke about the story of Europe, who was brought from the syro palestinian coast to Crete. Uh, from this point of view, it's quite interesting to insist on one point in the story of art. The first really European civilization is the Malinoan civilization. Why? Because with the Malinoan civilization for the first time, we have a, a solution of continuity between uh, the Oriental art, the Egyptian art, and the, the new and the first European civilization. I think it could be perhaps interesting in the museum to insist on this point. When is beginning the European civilization? I think the European civilization begins when in the second millennium BC we uh, see the Mayan civilization in Crete and then from the Mayan civilization, the Mycenaean and then the Greek civilization, who is certainly one of the main forms of, with the classical message of the European history. Thank you very much. Uh, this book agrees with you totally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And the last question, Joanna. of the Second World War in Gdańsk. Now I work here as a curator. And uh, I was very moved and impressed by your provocative thought that maybe it would be easier and maybe even better to let uh, all those uh, national historians, politicians, to fill our museums with their national stories. And uh, maybe let's play a bit with this thought. And uh, what do you think, what, would, what could be the result of it? Would it be an interest? Would it be admiration? Would it be boredom? Would it be competition of history? How would it be? And then uh, you, uh, who uh, dedicated a great part of your work uh, to let people understand this very distant country, which is Poland for an average um, a British um, reader, uh, how to speak about such a distant history, such a distant past of a distant land uh, to be understood, maybe to raise controversies, but uh, to get some more than um, a boredom when we talk about something which doesn't ring a bell. Uh, so the Museum of the Second World War tried to uh, talk by comparison. Is it a good way? I don't know. It failed. So what is your recipe for that? Thank you. Um, I don't have a recipe, but I do have a vague idea. I think it would be a nice experiment to give a little corner, not a whole big floor, but a little corner, where these governments or these representatives of national history can put whatever they like. Uh, and then you go around and look at them. Uh, and you'll find the Polish cor corner is full of things that are missing from this museum. You'll go to the Bulgarian corner and you'll find it's full of things that we've never heard of at all. You'll go to the Slovenian corner <laughs> and you find that it contradicts what the Austrians say about this, that, or the other, <laughs> and so on. Um, um, I think the mistake we make is that national history was a very, very central subject of concern in the 19th and 20th centuries. It's not whether you like it or not. That's what people thought, that's how people were taught. And it should be part of the exhibition to show what people's mentality was. Uh, and it's very instructive. We have it in Britain. 
If you go to a Welsh school, you find that Welsh children learn things the English have never heard of at all. Scotland has a, a separate system of education, which is better than the English uh, system, and they also learn Scottish history, where the emphasis is on all sorts of different things. As you probably know, the Battle of Waterloo was won by Scots fighting against Poles. <laughs> um, uh, and so on and so on. Um, uh, and these perspectives are very instructive. Uh, it's not a question of whether the balance is right. All the national hi uh, histories are very biased. They're all about self-images. They're not about objectivity. They're about what we feel about ourselves. But that's very important. Let them have a go. Let them. Let the Welsh dragon. Uh, you should go to a football match between England and Wales, and you'll learn a lot of history. <laughs> and the Welsh sing a lot better than the English do. Um, no, these these are it's a very important thing, and um, I have one or two other suggestions which might um, improve the. Uh, um, the exhibition. I think it's tremendous. I think it's uh, amazing that it's here, having seen what it was like before Taya arrived. Um, but it's not yet perfect, and I think it needs fine-tuning, it needs additions here and there, and um, it will get better and better. <laughs>